Thank you, Gary, so much for those words. As an historian of religion, I can't express in words how much it means to me to finally be able to work here in Germany where the modern study of religion, as I understand it, began, and to be here in Berlin with its extraordinary wealth of resources and scholarly expertise so delightfully represented among the Academy's honored guests tonight. And I want to thank in particular John Thomas Eldringham and the entire remarkable Academy staff together with the Academy's supporters and especially the Anna Maria Kellen family for making tonight possible. To my fellow fellows from whom I've learned so much, even on poker night, I hope I'm able to give back something of what you've given me and that I can offer something for all of you tonight something for artists and writers and composers and poets and historians and humanists and scholars and thinkers of law and media. And to everyone here tonight on this windy, seemingly apocalyptic evening before <laughs> Das Osterfest, yeah? thank you for being here. I'd like to begin this evening with a well-known example of text destruction from the Bible, or at least an especially cinematic or iconic moment in the movie whether it be Charlton Heston or Mel Brooks. <laughs> I'd like to let this story serve as a gateway back to the beginnings of writing itself. And as I then present a remarkable selection of artifacts that attest to the strategic destruction, the physical destruction of inscribed materials in Mesopotamian, North African, and Levantine antiquity, and as I point to possible interpretive roots that can help navigate this ancient cultural landscape where writing was a ritual activity that could physically embody divine will and human relationships through words inscribed upon stones, and tablets, and scrolls, and where inscribed imagery resists distinctions between textual and iconographic forms of representation, and where the physical violation of texts and images was fully identified with the violation of identities and relationships inscribed and engraved upon them. So my focus, therefore, will be on the correlations between text destruction and iconoclasm. And I will end my talk with just the briefest of reflections on the resurgence of this kind of symbolic violence today. But more broadly, I'm interested in the enduring human, cognitive, social, and political dimensions of representation and symbolic violence. Why is the public strategic violation of texts and images such a preferred theater of social conflict? In what ways are these acts of destruction also acts of social production? What kind of work does this kind of symbolic violence do? OK, so beginning with the Bible, accounts of text destruction frame the biblical narrative of the rise and fall of ancient Israel and Judah. The first account is set at the dawn of Israel's social formation with the deliverance and destruction of stone tablets inscribed with divine legislation. And the next is set on the eve of the Babylonian conquest of Judah in 586 BCE. The biblical narrative, the biblical Sinai narrative reaches a dramatic climax in the golden calf episode. And uh, there's a handout here and I'll just read, and you could read along. You don't have to have a handout. Um, the key moment in this, in this most famous of biblical texts. Moses turned and went down from the mountain. Well, Dore here. Carrying the two tablets of the covenant. A covenant, by the way, is a treaty. It is the political metaphor for the relationship between the people of Israel and Yahweh, their patron deity carrying the two tablets of the covenant in his hands, tablets that were written on both sides, written on the front and on the back, duplex, just like the handout. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved upon the tablets. And as he came near the camp and saw the calf, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets from his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made, burned it with fire, ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. Now, the production and destruction of a calf formed of molten metal by human hands 
is here juxtaposed by the biblical authors with the production and destruction of law tablets inscribed by the fingers of God. The formation and worship of the metal calf is in fact a direct violation of the laws inscribed on the tablets themselves. Du sollst dir kein Bild machen. This is from a current exhibit at the Berliner Dom, just FYI. In response to the breaking of this law, Moses breaks the tablets on which, upon which das Bilderverbot were engraved, was engraved. Now, the book of Jeremiah narrates another episode in which an act of text destruction accompanies a covenant violation. In Jeremiah 36, Jehoiakim, one of the last sovereign kings of Judah, is read a scroll that warns of the violent consequences of breaking covenant relations with Yahweh. The king responds to this warning with violence against the scroll itself, which he tears and burns column by column as they're read to him. Jeremiah then informs Jehoiakim of the violent consequences of the king's action against the scroll and his rejection of its content. There'll be no heir to the throne of David after Jehoiakim's corpse is cast outside and the entire Davidic court, together with the inhabitants of Jerusalem, will experience the curses of the covenant invoked by the burned oracles of Jeremiah as the city burns like the scroll. Now, my focus tonight falls on the destruction of written words, beginning with those inscribed on Moses' tablets. But let me say first something about Aaron's calf. The creation and vivification of divine images in ancient Mesopotamia was achieved through a ritual algorithm called the mispee, or mouthwashing, or eye-opening ritual. This ritual explicitly severed the links between divine images and their human craftsmen. Without the mouth-opening ceremony, according to the mispee ritual incantations, the statue does not smell incense, does not eat food, does not drink water. Only after this Miss P ritual was identity, was the identity between divinity and statuary achieved as the sculpted form came alive into a ritualized blend of artifact and living thing. The destruction of cult images in ancient West Asia therefore targeted embodied living gods and Mesopotamian iconolaters did this often as pantheons were absorbed and reconfigured along with kings, peoples, and territories into the world's first empires. In other words, iconolaters, worshipers of images, were also iconoclasts. And in this respect, iconoclasm is a form of iconism, it's mirror image. Iconoclasts, of course, always engage the power of images, even if in violent opposition. Iconism, aniconism, iconoclasm, these are all descriptive categories and points along a ritual and representational continuum. And although cultural polemics against idolatry, a word nowhere to be found in the Bible, properly translated, employ the golden calf story to sharply distinguish between cults of images and religions of the book between text and images, I'd also place text production and text destruction within that same ritual and representational continuum. Iconism, aniconism, iconoclasm, text production, text destruction. The biblical authors, for example, express this more nuanced and unified understanding of the relationship between textual and iconographic modes of representation they depict, for example, Moses' tablets as a kind of mirror image of the calf. A subtle example of this is when Moses makes two new tablets. Right? When he does so, the biblical authors use a verb based on the Hebrew root to sculpt, pasal, which is typically, almost only, and always used for sculpting cult images, not engraving words. There are Hebrew words for engraving texts, but they choose, the biblical authors, to use a word to sculpt to describe how Moses makes this tablet. And by using this verb, the authors signify Yahweh's presence in the two stone tablets, which technically speaking become a kind of a statue, a pestle of Yahweh, because they're crafted literally by an act of sculpting, and because they're engraved with the sentence, I am Yahweh, your God, with God speaking out of the rock. The textualization of iconic ritual and correspondingly the ritualization of sacred texts finds expression also in biblical traditions of divine writing. As for example, when Moses' tablets are described as God's work 
And the writing is God's writing engraved upon the tablets, just as Mesopotamian rituals invoke divine origins for cultic statuary by stating, I did not make the statue, Ninigal, who is Ea, god of the smith, made it. The ritualized, iconic role of sacred text in later Judaism and Christianity is likewise prefigured in biblical ark traditions, which position, which position the ark housing Moses' refashioned tablets in the cella, the innermost sanctum, sanctum of the Jerusalem sanctuary, and eventually in the position of Torah scrolls in the cella, or ark, as it is called, of Greco-Roman synagogues, that is, the place traditionally occupied by, the cult, by cult images in almost all ancient sanctuaries. And as biblical texts came to occupy the traditional location of divine images, and as Jewish and Christian social groups dispersed throughout the Greco-Roman world, canon formation and acts of text destruction mirrored cult image construction and acts of iconoclasm as preferred modes of representation, social formation, and symbolic violence in the ancient Near East and Mediterranean. Now, as I now turn to evidence for text destruction in ancient Near Eastern traditions outside of the Bible, I want to highlight these aspects of iconic textuality. And when I speak of iconic texts, I'm referring not to a text's purely semantic dimensions, but rather to its symbolic and performative dimensions that mingle with its semantic content to imbue its material form with social agency. And now we'll begin a bit of a tour through a remarkable collection of artifacts. And what I hope to show is that the production and destruction of divine images has been closely associated with the production and destruction of sacred texts since the beginning of writing and inscribed iconography in third millennium BC Mesopotamia. And we'll begin with uh, an artifact, a textualized iconographic artifact that has a a truly remarkable biography of its own, a life of its own. This is what's called the Stela of the Vultures, the Stela of the Vultures. And it's from 25th, 24th century BC, and it's inscribed in the Sumerian language. This is the earliest narrative inscription. It is truly the beginnings of recorded history. It's the earliest well-documented historical episode, and it depicts a mid third millennium border conflict between the southern Mesopotamian states of Lagash and Uma. And the Stila's inscription describes how Aeonatum, the king of Lagash, defeated the ruler of Uma and installed and inscribed boundary stones marking the disputed border between these two early states. And what's interesting is that following a description of, the, uh, of, uh, of this, these installations of boundary stones, the inscription then is structured around a series of oaths, of oaths and curses, in which the ruler of the defeated Uma swears not to remove or destroy these inscribed stone boundary monuments. And a contemporary inscription associated with Aeonatum's nephew, Enmatana, recounts how, surprising, unsurprisingly, the ruler of Uma later did exactly that. He violated these oaths. And I'll just read, this is in, uh, uh, item number seven on your handout. The god Enlil, by his firm command, demarcated the boundary for the gods Ningirsu and Shara. And Mesilim, a third party arbitrator of a king of Kish, at the command of the god Ishtaran, surveyed the field and erected stela there. So stela is a stone monument inscribed. But Ush, the ruler of Uma, acted arrogantly. He ripped out or smashed those stelas and marched upon the steppe of Lagash. Now, the stela of the vultures represents the installation and violation of stone monuments as pivotal engagements with physical representations of divine will and human social contracts inscribed on them. And its oaths negotiate territorial hegemony by orchestrating human interactions with those stone monuments. Moreover, this Sumerian monument was itself most likely installed in a ritual setting in the temple of Ningirsu in Girsu. And this ritualized social agency of this stone monument, the stela of the vultures, is textually invoked towards the end of its inscription where we read, this stela, its name, is not a man's name. It is the god Ningirsu, lord, crown of Luma, life of the Pyrrhic Eden Canal. This is a deified 
inscribed stone monument. Its deification was signified very clearly because the Sumerian language has what's called a divine determinative that, determinative that can be assigned to a name. And when you see that, right, Anum, yeah, An, uh, this indicates uh, the name of a, a divine being, a divine being. Right? So these earliest narrative monuments were ritualized agents. They were given names. They were often inscribed in the first person as if they spoke. And they received sacrifices and had temples and temple personnel. OK, uh, very briefly, I want to point to a, uh, uh, a few other objects from that same time and place. Uh, this time and place would be early dynastic and old Akkadian Mesopotamia. We're in the mid to late third millennium. And what we have here uh, elsewhere in this early dynastic Sumerian period is the emergence of a, a, a tradition in which you have inscribed statues of kings and gods. And on these statues, we have a, an emerging tradition of curse formulas, curses that prescribe acts of text erasure, rewriting, removal, and destruction. And these curses in increasingly, over the course of the third millennium, start to focus on the power of inscribed names. And really, in the beginning was the name. These curses prohibit the erasure and usurpation, which means like uh, 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 crossing out one name and putting your own name upon it. These curses prohibit erasure and usurpation of one ruler's name with that of another. And very briefly, item number nine in the handout, this is a statue of Gudea of Lagash, mid to late third millennium. And its curse at the end of its inscription just uh, says, if the future ruler's mind is set on erasing this inscription, let his own name disappear from the temple of his personal god and be removed from the tablet. This is a, uh, the first example of what we see as a, a, a developing tradition of reciprocal curses, reciprocation. And by the end of the third millennium, curses prohibiting acts of text erasure, usurpation, and destruction are inscribed upon Sumerian and south, uh, most southern Mesopotamian public monuments such frequency and formulaic consistency that they can be described as the foundations of a long-lived, ritually patterned, and politically motivated ancient Near Eastern text destruction tradition. And in this tradition, the complete monistic identity between the material form of an iconographic or textual representation and its semantic content remains the operative principle and power behind the production, deployment, and destruction of publicly displayed iconography and inscriptions throughout the ancient Near East for millennia to come. And here we have another remarkable artifact with a long biography of its own. I'll just say briefly, this is the Victory Stela of Naram Sin. It's a 23rd century Akkadian, old Akkadian monument. Interestingly, it's in the Louvre, whereas it, it should technically be in the British Museum. The reason is because it was produced in Mesopotamia, in Iraq, and in Iraq you had British uh, 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 excavations. But this one was excavated from Susa in ancient Iran. And the reason is because even though it was produced by Naram Sin, an old Akkadian king in the 23rd century, it was a thousand years later abducted and usurped by an Elamite king, a culture from ancient Iran. Uh, the king's name was Shutruk Nahunte, and this king, a thousand years later, 1,000 years later, transformed <coughs> Naram Sin's Sumerian monument to a memorial of his own victories and dedicated it to his own patron deity. Right? And Naram Sin's uh, inscription, uh, we can't tell. I, I personally don't think it was purposely erased, but it, it's, it's really not uh, readable anymore. But what definitely is readable is the Elamite inscription that Shutruk Nahunte uh, inscribed upon this earlier monument. And that's item number 10. He just simply writes, I took this stela and I took it back to Elam. I set it before in Shushanak, my god, as an offering. And he knew exactly what this was. He didn't destroy it. He took it home. He abducted it. And he usurped it. He didn't destroy it. That is to say, he. he he transformed it in a way that perpetuated its power and transferred its power to a new kingdom and to a new identity. Um, so yes, from southern Mesopotamia to southern Iran to now in 
Paris, right, where it attests to perhaps the uh, colonial power of, a, of uh, uh, France in, in, in the ancient Near East. These monuments have lives of their own. Um, again, very briefly, those uh, boundary monuments that I talked about with the first item, um, uh, the uh, Steel of the Vultures, here's an example of one. Approximately half of the 160 or so Babylonian boundary stones that were uh, 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 found uh, uh, in, in Susa, right, were abducted uh, 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 by the same Elamite king that abducted the Naram Sin stela. And these boundary stones, here's an example of one, are often inscribed with curses prohibiting their violation and removal, and they all appear to have suffered exactly that same fate. <coughs> so this is from a 12th century uh, southern Mesopotamian king, Mel Melishipak, and what's happened is the entire, whoops, uh, the entire surface of the original inscription was rubbed down, was rubbed down. And no new text was inscribed upon it. This is strange. But what's interesting also is that the iconography has apparently been damaged too. And what you see, right, God, whoop, excuse me, God, priest, king. What you have are the hands of the God and the priest severed and the face of the king severed. In other words, what we have here, it seems, is a kind of a, a corollary act of selective iconoclasm, which seems to have severed the relationship between divinity and royalty that this boundary monument formally embodied and, configures, and, and configured. Right? And this same, this same monument, actually, on the other side, is inscribed with characteristic curses. The curse on this one says, whoever removes this stone monument from its station and places it where it can't be seen, casts it in water or fire, covers it with dust, or erases what's inscribed on it, or alters the aforementioned acts and changes that information, da, da, da. What's, what we have here then right, are abducted artifacts from Susa that exhibit traces of effaced or older inscriptions that have been replaced with new inscriptions that warn against any subsequent act of text defacement, usurpation, and destruction. OK, here's a perhaps slightly more familiar uh, monument. This is the Stela of Hammurabi, an old Babylonian law code from the 18th century BC. This also is in the Louvre. It should be in the British Museum. This also was found abducted in, Syria, in, in, um, in Susa. Um, and I'll read the, uh, the, the, the curse inscription that concludes this this law code, um, item number 12. Should that man not heed my words, which I've inscribed upon my stela, and should he slight my curses and not fear the curses of the gods and, o and thus overturn the judgments that I rendered, change my words, alter my engraved designs, erase my inscribed name and inscribe his own name in its place concerning that man, may the god Enlil declare the obliteration of his city the dispersion of his people, the supplanting of his dynasty, and the blotting out of his name and his memory from the land. I love these curses. The curses really uh, make up uh, the bulk of the evidence for text destruction traditions because, needless to say, the archaeological evidence is, by definition, fragmentary. Yeah? <laughs> Thank you for laughing. That's got to be the most nerdy joke I've ever heard. <laughs> and you're the first audience that's ever laughed at me. Yeah. Uh, the curses on the Hammurabi Code anticipate violations right, of the laws inscribed upon it, and of the, this, uh, the stone is called diorite, the diorite monument itself, its iconography and its materiality. And the longevity of the monument is equated with the laws themselves and with Hammurabi's identity itself, right? all of which is embodied iconographically and engraved, uh, uh, embodied textually and iconographically in the engraved image and inscribed names and laws of this, of this monument. And again, here we have the reciprocal logic of these curses. It's actually beautifully inscribed. Uh, the threats against the ruler's image and name are met with reciprocal threats against the name, memory, and lineage of the potential violator. And uh, if you remember that uh, 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 biblical text when Jeremiah uh, uh, warns the king, Jehoiakim, of the consequences of burning the scroll. These are exactly the curses that fall upon the king, an end to his dynastic secession and an end to the kingdom. Right? These were the curses of the covenant. These curses of the covenant are also inscribed in the book of Deuteronomy, a law code, which ends with curses. Right. Okay, um, moving along, this is one of my favorite 
uh, 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 pieces of evidence. These are the succession treaties of Esarhaddon, <coughs> an eighth century neo, excuse me, seventh century neo Assyrian king. These are treaties, political treaties. In, these, in this case, these treaties enforce oaths of loyalty upon vassal princes to Esarhaddon's successors. And what's interesting is around 350 fragments of these treaties were found scattered around the throne in a throne room next to the temple of Nabu, the scribal god of Nimrud, ancient Kalhu, recently in the news, by the way, Nimrud. Now, according to the excavators, Right, these fragments of this text were deliberately, deliberately mutilated or smashed before the throne of the Assyrian king. And this happened, they argue, during the conquest of this city, the conquest of ancient Kalhu, by Medes and Babylonians in around 612 BC. And what's also interesting is in the same room where we have these treaty fragments, we found ivory inlays depicting tribute bearers, and these were also broken in pieces and laid around the throne among the treaty fragments. In other words, these seem to be the iconographic counterparts to the succession treaty tablets, and they shared the same fate. When Kalhu was conquered by the former vassals, they destroyed the, uh, uh, the in other words, the, the, the treaty text textually represented the former vassal status of the Medes who destroyed Kalhu. And when the social order was overturned, so too were its iconographic and textual representations in these ivy lin inlays and treaty tablets. Um, also, interestingly, these treaties curse those who break the stipulations of the treaty, the laws themselves, together with those who break or erase the treaty tablets. They equate the content with the physical form. And it includes, of course, then the curses that we expect number uh, 13, I think, in the handout. If you should remove it, this treaty, or consign it to fire, or throw it in the water, or bury it in the earth, or destroy it by any cunning device, or annihilate, or, def or deface it, then you have the consequences. And what's also interesting, what's also interesting is I indicated the possible location of the broken treaties. Well, copies of this treaty were actually found elsewhere in um, Tel Tayanat in the ancient Near East, and they were seemingly installed in a temple. They were, uh, the treaty was like, drilled through the back and installed, much like a cult image in an ancient Near Eastern temple. And the treaty themselves, themselves have an interesting uh, line towards the end where it says, you shall guard this treaty tablet, which is sealed with the seal of the god Ashur, king of the gods, and set up in your presence like your own god, like your own god, as if it were a living, uh, a living thing, a living god. All right? And here I'll just remind you of the Sinai tablets, where you have ritualized texts placed in an ark right, that is then placed in the most sacred space in the temple in Jerusalem. And of course, also the correlations between the destruction of texts and destruction of images in the golden calf episode that I started with. Okay, um, just a few more images uh, from this part of the world. This, is, this might be my favorite of them all because it has such a remarkable example of selective erasure and ritualized associations. This is the uh, stele of Nergal Eresh. Uh, this is from a site in ancient Iraq, uh, uh, ancient uh, uh, Assyria in uh, temporary Iraq, Tel Al-Rima. And what we have is a monument inscribed, an uh, iconographic monument. Um, and where it was found was exactly where you'd expect a cult image to be found, right next to the sacrificial altar in a late Assyrian temple. Now, who was this guy, Nergal Erish? He was an imperial administrator of a neo-Assyrian king whose name was Adad Nirari. And the text begins with an account of the campaigns of this emperor, Adad Nirari, in the West. But the second half, and this is the part that's erased, lists all of the towns that his administrator, this guy Nergal Erish, resettled. It seems that someone had something against this guy. And what they did was they wiped out not the emperor's accomplishments, but Nergal Erish's and what were once curses against doing anything like that on the bottom. 
And I don't do this kind of thing, but if you, know, if you could you know, really blow it up, there are traces of that early inscription. That's why we know what it says. And of course, right, that text says that was erased. Whoever erases a single name from these names, may the great gods angrily look with dis disfavor upon him. The first half is in an excellent state of preservation. The second half is selectively chiseled out. And this really exemplifies a kind of ritualized deployment and effacement of inscribed iconographic monuments in ancient West Asia, I think in a way that really challenges modern distinctions between images and texts and cultic statuary and monumental inscriptions, gods and kings, religion and politics, symbols and their reference. Uh, here's an example. So that's how it was found. See, it wasn't totally destroyed. That's the altar. It's remarkable. Uh, I know we have uh, some Egyptologists here. Please forgive me. I only have, I think, one slide of, uh, uh, from ancient Egypt, but I also know that nowhere, nothing attests to the iconolatry of writing, the association of imagery and, and, and textuality more than ancient Egypt's scribes of the house of life, as they were called. The House of Life. Uh, what we have here is uh, an Egyptian variation on name usurpation. These are cartouches. These are the signatures of Egyptian pharaohs. And in the New Kingdom period, particularly in the 18th and 19th dynasties, in the uh, uh, mid and then late uh, uh, second millennium BC, we have numerous instances of what we call cartouche usurpation. So here's what we're looking at, and that's what it looks like there. But Looking deeply, you can see that what's happened is that once upon a time, there was a name of the pharaoh Merneptah, right? And Merneptah seems to have had an uneasy succession battle, followed by uh, uh, his successor, Amen Messe, who then chiseled out Merneptah's cartouche and put his own. And then the same was done to Amen Messe by another pharaoh, Seti II, right? So these late 19th dynasty monuments, you see them uh, 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 frequently in Egypt. They're replete with usurpations in which cartouches were usurped again and again. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we have other examples of this from other dynasties, but it seems like in particular there were some ideological and uh, 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 battles and succession battles. You may have heard of Akhenaten, some people attribute him with the invention of monotheism. I don't, but he also participated in this. A lot of the Akhenaten cartouches usurped and were usurped by other pharaohs. OK, with that, we're, oh yeah, I can't talk about uh, name usurpation without giving a shout out to uh, uh, street art and tagging, which the same thing happens in Berlin and New York, right? You'll have the tags, and then someone will come and erase. I mean, it's a different phenomena, but still. It's not totally different. And now we leave ancient Mesopotamia, and now we're moving. What we're going to do is just with a few more images, uh, go back to um, the uh, more uh, local vicinity of the lands in which the Hebrew Bible was written, or, um, at least most of it, in the southern Levant. And so here we're in Lebanon. And this is, um, this is at the uh, mouth of a river uh, called the Dog River, Nahar al Kalb, and it, and it comes right out into the Mediterranean. And it was just the place where any emperor who wants to move from West Asia to uh, uh, the Mediterranean is going to arrive at the Mediterranean. And what you have on the walls, and on the, rather on the cliffs, are side by side a series of victory monuments where successive emperors would indicate that they were there and what they did. But what's interesting is that in, whoop, excuse me. Uh, OK, well, I don't have a good. Uh, OK, forget that. Well, um, what you have in one of them in, I believe, uh, this one is uh, a, um, an inscription of, of all people, uh, Napoleon III. And if you look carefully, that inscription was written over a New Kingdom Egyptian inscription. And what happened after that in World War I is that an Ottoman soldier actually uh, uh, chiseled out Napoleon's inscription. Um, and uh, so, yeah, this is a... Uh, an interesting example of, uh, of a continued tradition in, uh, in the Nahar al Kelb inscriptions. I don't, know, uh, I don't know the status of them now. Um, now I want to move to uh, the, a little south now, the, uh, the world of Phoenicia. Right? And so here we're moving from the east to the west cultural and li linguistic spheres. And what we see are similar curses against 
inscription, effacement, removal, usurpation, right? What we have is a, the, the transference of this tradition from the earlier West to the later East Semitic sphere, excuse me, earlier East to the later West Semitic sphere in the first millennium. And here, uh, this is uh, 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 perhaps the earliest connected alphabetic uh, Phoenician text. And what it is, is it's a, it's a coffin and its uh, uh, Phoenician text threatens potential violators with dynastic cessation and reciprocal act of sepulchral destruction and effacement. I'll just read this, number 16. If a king among kings or a governor among governors or a commander of an army should come up against Byblos, the city where this was found, beautiful site on the coast of Lebanon, and uncover this sarcophagus, May the scepter of his rule be uprooted. May the throne of his kingdom be overturned. And may peace depart from Byblos. And as for him, may his inscription be effaced. May his inscription be effaced. Um, so here we have, again, that reciprocal logic of second millennium curses. And what's interesting is that the word to efface here appears very frequently in the Bible. Um, there are many biblical traditions in which uh, we read about the uh, emplacement and blotting out of names and memories of people and places. And the word they use for emplacement often mirrors the word for the installation of a stone monument. And the word for effacing is exactly this word that is used in the Ahiram sarcophagus when it says, may his inscription be effaced. So, uh, names of individuals, names of kingdoms, memories, etc. We see this uh, 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 throughout. And also, uh, interestingly, if you this is the Phoenician inscription. If you looked really carefully, that inscription is written over a series of earlier 13th century inscriptions. And what's happened is um, Ahiram of, uh, of Byblos was buried in this, right? And his son Itobal, right? Itobal, right? What he did is he found a 13th century sarcophagus and usurped it and inscribed over it and put his, uh, 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 his father's body in it. And then in the inscription that he put over it, he cursed anyone who would do that kind of thing again. Yeah? And a lot of the early, early Phoenician inscriptions from this place, uh, uh, Byblos, exhibit these kinds of uh, 13th century inscriptions that were chiseled away and then new uh, alphabetic inscriptions were, were put uh, over them. Okay. Um, I just wanted to put uh, uh, include this. This is the uh, Kila Mua orthostat um, because this is here in the uh, Forder Asiaticus Museum in Berlin. You can go see it. It's a late 9th century Phoenician text and just, you know, it shouldn't be a surprise now. If anyone smashes this inscription, may Baal Tzemet of Gabar smash his head and may Baal Hamon of Bama and Rakibel, the lord of the dynasty, smash his head. Yeah? I like that one. And this is from uh, the same place, Zinchili in Anatolia. Um, this one was uh, discovered more recently uh, uh, by a Chicago excavation. So um, I, I forget where it, it was, 2009, but it was from the same site, Zinchili. What I like about this, it's very interesting. It includes in this inscription uh, the sentence, uh, 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 a, refer a reference to uh, a sacrifice in which this uh, king Kutamua, or Katimua, says, a ram for my soul that is in this stila. A ram for my soul. Yeah? As if a soul can be somehow embodied in this inscription, and it is here textually indicated like that. OK. Um, the last artifact I'll show is one from the direct location of our biblical authors. This is from Tel Dan in northern Israel. It brings us back to the Bible and the local world of the authors. This is actually the earliest reference to a dynasty of David. That doesn't mean that everything we read about in the books of Samuel and Kings is true, like uh, per se, but it is evidence uh, that to say it, 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 that it all happened according to uh, as we read it. But but there is this is extra biblical evidence for the existence of a Davidic dynasty. But what interests me is that this is an Aramaic monument. It was installed by an Aramaic king who had conquered the northern borderlands of Israel and installed this monument as a victory steal of the sort that we've seen. And what we found, right, is that uh, it was then, uh, it was a ninth century Aramaic monument, but it was found dispersed in eighth century archeological contexts. Again, like that Tel Arima stela, the inscription is in very good, uh, very fine state of <coughs> preservation, but the, but the monument itself was, 
was broken up in pieces. And the excavators suggest that this was smashed by Israelites when the Israelite kings who recovered these uh, northern borders uh, uh, decided to, uh, to uh, wipe away the uh, presence and power that the Aramean king had left in the embodied monument. Um, archaeological evidence of this sort is kind of speculative. But I would say, given the other literary and archaeological evidence I've reviewed from the broader biblical world, all the curses and narratives, and examples of this in the Bible itself, we would expect to see similar acts of text destruction patterns in, in the biblical, archaeological, and literary record. And I argue, we do. OK. So to conclude, um, the identity between the meaning of a text and the text artifact itself, or the referent of an image and the image itself, was achieved in ancient West Asia through the ritual integration of its material form, semantic <coughs> content, and interactive social role. Evidence of purposeful violence against images and texts ritually illuminates this identity between medium and message, and ideologically motivated acts of iconoclasm and inscripticlasm I don't think in the OED, were common politically effective components of broader processes of social formation, including state formation and imperial expansion. And more broadly, my interest tonight has been to suggest that a ritual algorithm has functioned for thousands of years along a continuum of human representational practices. Iconism, aniconism, iconoclasm, text production, text destruction, to achieve what cognitive science might describe as an ontological fluidity across domains of knowledge and experience associated with inanimate artifacts and living things. Now, in some cases, text artifacts were entirely destroyed through acts intended to blot out forever the names, identities, and memories of the gods, humans, and social relationships inscribed upon them. In other cases, the destruction of text was the very act that actualized aspects of their content. Yeah. All of these curses and Jeremiah's burned scrolls is very important. Burning them activated their content. There's an ancient Taoist uh, uh, text which, uh, which uh, uh, likens the, it. You're supposed to burn this Taoist ritual text. And, and what it says is burning it will, uh, uh, it's like illuminating a lamp through its meaning. Yeah. Yeah. So destruction of text doesn't always mean negating. It sometimes means actualizing their, just their semantic content. Now, in most cases, the violation of text did not entail their complete destruction, but rather their transformation in ways that preserved and usurped and amplified their power in greater perpetuity. Remarkably, therefore, the meaning and power of ancient texts is realized not only through their writing and reading, but also through their physical manipulation, transformation, and destruction. Now, these iconic aspects of textuality influence the scripturalization of Israelite religion in the first millennium BC and beyond. In this respect, the shadow cast over biblical religion by post-biblical polemics against idolatry obscures what's otherwise clear from the cultural record. The inscribed iconography of the biblical world resists any sharp division between iconographic and textual modes of representation. And a focus on text destruction identifies these iconic aspects of textuality more clearly than does a focus on iconoclasm. I think because of the idolatry tradition, iconoclasm has received more uh, systematic uh, attention in the history of religion and in the history of scholarship, but text destruction less so. A twin focus on text destruction and iconoclasm can further illuminate the iconic, numinous nature of writing in the ancient world and thereby help bridge the gap between word and image that cleaves the biblical religion of modern imagination. Even damaged inscriptions can in this way embody in their fragmentary state clues to their meaning for the ancients who created and interacted with them. The gap between a written sign and the meaning it signified, which was explicitly conflated and ritually intertwined by the ancients, by the ancients, might be bridged when modern readers reconstruct and reconnect an ancient text's semantic content, social location, and material form. The text artifacts that we recover from the past are, in the end, never fully emptied of their power as social agents. From Susa to Nineveh to Alexandria, successive empires of antiquity abducted and violated representations of the past. The scale of these violations led to the loss as well as to the preservation 
of the textual and iconographic embodiments of the gods, kings, and peoples of the ancient world. I mean, sometimes things are preserved when a city is attacked and the roof falls on the archive. Yeah? The power of these representations and the, pra and the practice of their abduction and usurpation remains on display now in the libraries and museums of the Middle East, Europe, and North America today. In closing, I'm hesitant to find any meaning at all in the destruction of antiquities that's taken place in Iraq and Syria this past month. I mean, almost all of the artifacts I've discussed fall in, uh, under this threat, all the sites. Right, this latest inter iteration of the looting and destruction of antiquities and ancient sites that began in 2003 at best only adumbrates the humanitarian catastrophe unfolding before our eyes in the cradle of civilization with no end in sight. It's doubtful whether those who are looting and destroying antiquities and burning books in and around Mosul, the Assyrian heartland, are aware right, that it was Assyria itself that developed the destruction of cityscapes, statuary, and human life into a kind of dark art. Right? It's also doubtful whether the world media broadcasting these spectacles of symbolic violence will devote equal footage to the concomitant loss of human life in those same places. For the iconography, the iconography of iconoclasm yeah, is and has always been designed for viewing. And whether through ritual or digital algorithms, the target is cultural memory itself to transform the present by erasing the past. And the empty spaces left behind can then sometimes only become memorials of a different kind that fill with a sacred emptiness in an aniconic blend of presence and absence like the twice destroyed sanctuary of silence now textually represented in the world's iconic book. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll move it to a slightly more encouraging image. <clears throat> William. So thanks, Nathaniel. Terrific. Um, I mean, really provocative set of ideas. And I just want to pick up where you left off. The condition that's changed from the period you spent most of your talk on to the present that you kind of ended with is the spread of literacy and the spread of access to the text. Mm. Texts become more pervasive and the ability to decode those texts is also more widespread in the present. Mm. Um, so I, I, I take your point that this has both a symbolic and a very real meaning in antiquity, in, in the ancient, you know, in the biblical era. But things like Kristallnacht or Mosul, when people, you know you're not really eradicating that you're symbolically eradicating a text. You're not really effacing it because there are too many copies to be effaced. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm just interested in, in how you see, is it, is it simply the, is the continuity a, a symbolic continuity, a, a continuity of performance, or is there something more, back in the day when the word was flesh and when the word of God couldn't be spoken, when the word had a different power than today, how do you make that leap across time? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough leap to make, and I make it with caution. I'm not saying that there are direct continuities, but I, if you simply uh, put aside the meaning and just look at the practice, there seem to be certain continuities, and the question is then how to explain them. And, you know, that gets into the difficult realm of how people think and how people thought. Um, and what I've tried to point to <coughs> is the you know, the, these uh, processes of representation. I mean, when I'm talking about gods or books or, or, or images, I'm always really talking about people, right? It always comes back to that, people and their ways of interacting with each other and with other objects in the world. And I think that humans have a tendency to anthropomorphize their environment and also to structure it through these practices that involve some kind of manipulation with representations 
of who they are, their social relationships, their understandings of divinity, of each other, of themselves. <clears throat> and somehow I think it's through these practices. I mean, again, I'm very interested in the way you know, ancients think. That's really what I'm trying to do. But they, don't, they never tell us. They never tell us why, right? But <clears throat> if you look at what they write, you see right, that they did interact with these objects as if they were alive, right? Today, I mean, certainly, books, I mean, as I tried to you know, indicate, and, and statues mm -hmm. are not people, right? And, and yet, people choose to interact with them in similar ways. I think that's the continuity. I mean, uh, I, again, like, not so, uh, if you can just start with the description and then cautiously move towards interpretation, my general approach to religion is to focus on what humans do and, and why they do it, especially when they don't really tell you why, right? And, uh, and you know, sometimes people do things without really reflecting on them so much. And then when it comes to ethnographies and uh, uh, intellectual histories, trying to understand why they do these things, I think for me, again, the, the focus is always on, 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 the, uh, on the actions, on the practices. And I think that's right now, as far as I'd go in terms of continuities, I think there are some universal cognitive structures that you know, are continuous for you know, uh, uh, thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years in the human brain. I could talk about that more. Uh, in terms of anthropomorphism and representation and how humans structure their environment that way through the manipulation of representations. But I think my, my you know, not, not to repeat myself, but you know, my focus is really on you know, what people do and its social effects. This is what I indicated at, you know, at the beginning. What kind of work does this symbolic violence do? And it, it seems both in antiquity and in modernity to serve some kind of social purpose. <coughs> This kind of destructive behavior is, and this is not a value issue, socially productive. And I think that's where we can try and get some interpretive mileage out of this or, or try and understand these practices. What, why do people do that? What do they do? What, you know, why do they do this? How does it kind of serve to structure an environment, a social environment? I think that's where the, the, the productivity comes out of this destructive behavior. And I think that's where the continuity might lie between all its forms in different periods and cultures. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, for this uh, interesting talk. I have two questions and a nerdy remark. Uh, the quest first question is about uh, um, this uh, uh, erasing names from statues and so on has survived, let's say, at least until uh, the Romans with the Dam Damnasia Memore and uh, all that kind kind of stuff. Um, and uh, but we even have this uh, uh, destruction of text, parts of texts. Um, in, uh, in in the way the Bible was uh, was created in uh, uh, well it just had the name and now it's gone um, in in this uh, famous uh, uh, um, conclave at uh, uh, the name of the town I, I don't remember so uh, Nicaea? Nicaea, yeah. yes in, in uh, when 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 the the, yeah, the, yeah, the canonization yeah. yes yeah, the canonization yeah. happened yeah, which yeah. was uh, 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 would you would you talk about this in yeah, in the sure. same kind Absolutely. the second yeah. second question is um, uh, if you come from a more productive part uh, as let's say an author or an artist yeah. uh, destroying parts of texts or uh, the productive use of uh, texts in new texts or in new uh, new uh, um, new pictures, as maybe the the reuse of uh, of uh, uh, tissue for for a new yeah. uh, picture. Music too. Yeah, you have the this all this uh, this kind. How how do you, how do you uh, use it? And uh, the second these these warnings. Um, uh, for uh, uh, 
before defacing uh, something have survived too um, mm -hmm. in uh, the the as well as the defacing of of, uh, of statues, which is. Uh, in the defacing of websites where you find uh, it's uh, again happening and we also have the warnings uh, if you look at emails uh, where uh, not the gods but the lawyers are cited for um, <laughs> so thank you yeah thank you uh, uh, yeah briefly a canonization I alluded to it at the beginning of my talk and I'd be delighted to talk about it more I, I, I mean it's certainly a remarkable Example. Uh, I mean, there's no end to the you know where you can go with this kind of analysis. And uh, yes, uh, I describe uh, the <coughs> canonization process, the creation of the Bible, right, as a process of literary and social inclusion and exclusion, right. And of course, the books of the losers are burned, and the books of the winners are called orthodoxy, and everything else is called heresy. And this orthodoxy heresy dialectic is precisely the social equivalent and theological equivalent of the uh, text uh, production and destruction that I've been talking about. And, um, and it's uh, kind of second level literary uh, 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 expression would be canon formation, yeah? Um, yeah, yeah. And then, um, so I could also, I'd be delighted to, but I don't want to keep you here too long, uh, talk about artistic versions of this and musical versions of it. I mean, uh, I, I, I've you know, been thinking about this uh, all the time since I've been in Berlin. I mean, this is, of course, an example of how destruction is a process of creation, or in fact, destruction is not really destruction, it's transformation. It's, a, it's, it's, it's the uh, uh, use and reuse of, uh, of uh, uh, human creative uh, expressions uh, in new forms. I mean, uh, and, and this is what, uh, this is what uh, happens all the time in sampling in music um, and uh, in, uh, yeah, in uh, modern art all the time, yeah? And so uh, these, are, these are wonderful uh, contemporary uh, alternative ways to express the same fundamental point about the correlations between text and images and the social productivity of cultural transformation, violation, destruction, usurpation, and, uh, and, uh, and so, yes, creation, destruction, uh, these are uh, the mirror images of iconism, <coughs> iconism and iconoclasm, yeah? Um, yeah, so. I'm taking that a step further. Um, you've talked about the destructive and the generative. What about the consumptive, the consumption? Yeah, yeah, I know. Collection, like acquisition smuggling, whatever you want to call oh, it. Oh, con I thought you meant like it's consumption. All, like, no, I mean all the I above. Talked about that. But I mean, I'm talking specifically about <laughs> artifacts and texts that end up in museums yeah, or yeah, yeah. foundations and so on that may have been acquired through ill-gotten gains or positively, I mean, however that works, but. Right, right. I mean, these are the biographies of uh, these artifacts, yeah? Mm -hmm. And it's uh, been going on for uh, forever. And so, you know, as you indicated, you know, most of the, uh, Artifacts I, I, I've shown are in the Louvre mm -hmm. or in the British Museum, right, where they attest to the, you know, uh, colonial powers of uh, Britain mm -hmm. and, uh, and France and the Near East. And so um, are you asking specifically about uh, the, uh, the, the looting? The well, no, no, I think it's more specific about the, the social <coughs> and behavioral pattern that that aspect represents. There's a destruction of these things to sort of imply power and mm -hmm. the erasure of a culture. Mm -hmm. But what is the collection of them? <laughs> yeah, the collection of them is that they're, the, you know, they're the next stage in their lives, yeah? Um, uh, uh, the uh, transformation of, I mean, in, in other words, you know, destruction, I hope I've, uh, what, what I mean by destruction is, is quite uh, creative, to say the least. Um, you know, these, these, these uh, uh, so-called, you know, violations are really just adoptions, usurpations of the power that somehow the cultural power that inheres in the artifact or art uh, or, or that, you know, originally and then as it goes through successive expressions, whether through theft or, you know, in museums or private collections or hidden away as kind of secret, you know, even though there might be a curse against that, right? They don't like to, the curses, uh, you know, really don't like uh, uh, the curses uh, in these ancient monuments 
uh, often say, don't hide this from anyone, right? It's got to be in a social location, right? And it, again, it goes back to people and how they interact with these inanimate artifacts, right, uh, in ways that somehow uh, 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 structure social environments. And so that's, you know, that's the, that's, I would say, the life of the artifact is the way it can somehow uh, 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 enter into new social worlds through all of these processes that might be described as legitimate or illegitimate. So yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, that's doing exactly what I was suggesting is my approach earlier, is was you know, shifting the focus from the artifact to the people who interact with it, right? And there, it's never going to be pure destruction. It's always going to be a kind of usurpation or transformation or social production. I would say that's the kind of work this kind of behavior and these kinds of practices do. This is the socially productive work of what might be, on the outside, socially destructive practices. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for your lecture. Um, the, the picture that you had of the defaced hands and face mm. Uh, yeah, the Melly Shoe Park uh, prompted my question. Mm. What would happen if you focus more on the relationship between the graphemes and the icons? What I mean is sometimes the text can be, can be quite neut neutral, mm -hmm. and one could place another icon on the monument or take the icon that was there away. For instance, there's a uh, depiction of Moses leading the people through the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And then somebody puts a cross on this monument. Mm -hmm. Or you have a tombstone with a pedi in the pediment, the uh, couple that has been buried. The Christians will make tombstones like that, but put a cross in the pediment, and in the, uh, after the Ravi conquest, one will deface, not the text, but the icon, mm -hmm. take the cross away. So that is, that, that is a, a relationship between what is on the monument, between the icon and the written. Uh, would, it, would it bring other perspectives if you attend more to this folk? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, if I've uh, learned nothing else from this project so far, it is to move fluidly between textual and iconographic representations and interactions. I, you know, you can't always be sure that these uh, uh, acts of uh, text destruction are done by literate agents, yeah? And sometimes uh, it may be the case that, you know, a text uh, 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 might then be uh, random. I mean, the, the steel of Hammurabi has a has a, a part of it that's scratched out, but it's it's such a random part. It's nothing nothing clear. It doesn't seem to have been. It's probably happened when it was abducted from Mesopotamia to to Elam. Yeah, um, but there are other examples. There are some very interesting examples from uh, um, from Egypt of uh, of uh, uh, Roman iconography that's been plastered over uh, and repainted. And, and uh, absolutely, uh, you know, one can think of the catacombs in Rome, right? Um, Jewish catacombs that, um, and Christian catacombs, the iconography in there. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that that's a, that's a wonderful area to, to, to focus on. Um, it's the same issue. I mean, when it comes down to it, these are inscribed iconographic monuments that I've discussed. And one can also speak of narrative iconography. I described the stele of the vulture as, a, as vultures as the first uh, example of uh, 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 monumental narrative. <coughs> but you, know, you have all over Mesopotamia and you know, in ancient Assyrian palaces these, uh, 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 what do you call narrative iconography. They're just you know, stories, narratives in, in pictures. And in some cases, you do have, and in Egypt too, examples of effacement and then also transformation. Yeah, 
and, and so this would be the kind of iconographic equivalent of name usurpation, right? It is, it is imagery usurpation, um, and it really uh, achieves the same, same kind of work. It's not, of course, then destroying the object or violating it directly in terms of the perpetrator of this uh, action, but rather it's, uh, it's, it's um, adopting the power of the image that was already there and perpetuating it in a new form for a, a, a new identity and a new life. So yeah, I mean, there's a, that's a, that's a, uh, am I, am I understanding you're talking about then the? But one, one should maybe always also talk about the destruction of pictures. Yes, yes. And, and what? Yeah, you know, no, the reason I haven't focused on that is because that's what is often I, iconoclasm has received so much attention. I mean, what's happened in biblical studies just on one foot in the last 20 years or so is that in the 1990s, a lot of attention was focused on iconography, and that really challenged the way the biblical world, you know, uh, between the lines and in the landscape of ancient Israel, really was not so anti-iconic or iconoclastic <laughs> in reality. Um, and so there was a lot of attention to iconoclasm and iconism in the 90s. In the last 10 years or so, a lot of attention to production, textual production and the rise of literacy, right? So what I'm trying to do is combine those two recent developments in biblical studies, iconoclasm and iconography and text production, and look at them more holistically in terms of uh, uh, this ritualized continuum, iconism, and iconism, iconoclasm, text production and destruction. And I find that the issue of text destruction, for me, is the most fruitful way to engage all of that. And so I haven't focused primarily on the iconoclastic elements. But one thing I, I, I take from, from your comment is that what we can do is, through this issue of name usurpation, we can focus on a particular kind of iconoclasm, which is not the destruction of, 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 of imagery, but rather the more creative usurpation of it. And that's a, that's a wonderful area for, for further research. Absolutely. Thank you. I, I'm just thinking of the um, analogs in ordinary life uh, today. Uh, uh, and uh, one that strikes me is the head of an academic school of thought. Um, so here is the Dr. Fatah, um, who uh, uh, has gotten there by uh, killing his own Dr. Fatah and appropriating his uh, name. And the old Dr. Fatah is cursing the, the usurpers. Uh, and then is reenacting this thing with the next generation. Uh, and everybody knows that the next generation is going to uh, supplant the, the leader of the prior generation, uh, who will curse at the same time as he knows that he's going to be supplanted. Uh, um, and uh, uh, I was, uh, so uh, if we don't look upon this in this iconographic way, uh, but uh, talk about uh, the dynamics of succession. Uh, this is a very familiar process, question mark. Oh, yeah, sh certainly. I mean, I could think of, uh, of uh, various ways that that can uh, be expressed in my own experience. But I'd like to think, and I do actually feel. Is there any difference between, between that? I mean, well, yeah, because just like in, you know, you have uh, certain dynasties where there's a peaceful succession and things move forward. And then there are certain dynasties where there's a, you, hmm? I mean, when you say peaceful, you know, there is, uh, you know, uh, John Maynard Keynes who is being displaced by uh, Milton Friedman, who is being displaced by, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, even at his moment of ascendancy, he knows that he's being, going to be displaced and he's cursing people and trying to destroy their careers and things of this kind. <laughs> Just as, and, but fails. Well, when that kind of stuff gets really nasty, that's, that's peaceful? yeah. I, mean, I know it's peaceful. <laughs> well, no, I mean, when that kind of, uh, uh, you know, academic uh, lineage gets uh, rough, I think that's where we have to step in and say, ah, no, this is socially productive 
That's yeah? Right. And this is the way you move forward. And I, I, yeah. Weren't your examples more, I mean, because they were preserving part of the... Yes. I mean, it's it's yes. like uh, yeah. Yosef Dahn becomes the Gershom Scholem professor. They're trying to preserve the aura right. of the... Uh, mm -hmm. while, while killing them, of course, and, uh, unintentionally. Y yeah, uh, yeah. But um, they're not destroying the state, as they're, they're just transforming it. Right, right, right. And so That's the idea. Can I just quickly inject a pessimistic note? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> social, product, social productivity, et cetera. Uh, the exemplary moment in antiquity is, of course, a moment of irredeemable, irredeemable loss, the destruction of the Library of Alexandria. And I'm wondering if you have any, if that's paradigmatic for you or uh, a counterexample, or how, how you respond to the scholarship, or even just the example of that, of the of the destruction of a library. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, there we're getting perhaps closer to uh, a different kind of action here, where it is not selective. I mean, what I'm doing here is is looking at more selective, ideologically motivated examples. I think I don't know. Um, you know this, the 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 case of, of Alexandria, um, and also of uh, you know of Nineveh as well. Um, um, yeah, I think that you know on on that kind of a mass scale, it's harder to identify anything uh, socially productive out of that, except that uh, graduate students today have less. Uh, <laughs> uh, to read um, and so get their PhDs just a tiny bit quick, more quickly. But no, I don't mean to make light of that. Um, what I'm doing more uh, is looking more at these isolated examples um, and uh, with wholesale destruction, you know, uh, yeah, I don't see that, uh, that kind of productivity uh, only when texts are kind of inadvertently preserved uh, through the destruction of sites. Right, rather than um, uh, you know by you know the building collapsing on the archives themselves, right, and therefore um, preserved through the very acts that were meant to destroy them. Yeah, but um, but no, um, the destruction of of, uh, of the Alexandrian Library um, is, I think, uh, you know, less of a selective, ideologically motivated usurpation of. Uh, the uh, representations of human life that were lost within it. Yeah. Yeah. Nate, thanks.